Okay, well, very good uh, morning and a very warm welcome to you on a frosty, frosty day. Um, thank you so much for coming along to this PCA virtual support group meeting. Uh, for those of you who have not had the pleasure of meeting, uh, my name is Seb Crutch and I'm one of the psychologists at the Dementia Research Centre and the clinical lead for rare dementia support. And this, I'm not sure if I'm gesturing in the correct direction, is my wonderful colleague, Nikki, who will introduce herself. Hi, everybody. Good morning. It's fantastic to be here with you. I'm Nikki Zimmerman. I'm the lead of the direct support team and the support group meeting. So um, hopefully we'll provide a lot of support for you through the year, whether that's one to one support or within our peer support groups or our larger meetings and webinars like this. Um, it's fabulous to be here for the, the last one of the year for the PCA. Um, we hope we've provided a lot of support this year and hope to continue next year as well. Thanks, Nikki. So just a few uh, reminders about today. We're going to be hearing some uh, talks from uh, Dr. Keir Young and Dr. Emma Harding about sharing tips and strategies for supporting you um, in, in everyday activities. We're going to he be hearing um, some of the work, creative work that's been happening in 2023 with Charlie Harrison, our arts consultant. Um, we're going to be hearing some member experiences um, from Felicity and Julia. And um, we're going to be hearing a little bit about research opportunities as well. Uh, Nikki, before we um, kick into a brief description of what PCA is for new members, is there anything else you'd like to say? I know we've got to say about um, questions and answers um, for the panel later on. So today, really, no, we've got we've got the Q&A and &A and, uh, questions that will you can put in the question and answer box for us to ask later. So please put any questions in. It might be relevant relevant to the talks that you hear today. But it also could be any other questions that you feel you want to file over to us. If it's quite sort of personal questions, it might be a good idea that we follow up with you afterwards. So please do put your name in with that and one of the team can get in contact with you. Um, apart from that, I, I think the only other thing that I would like to say today is we are coming up to the Christmas time and I'm very aware that it can be quite a difficult time for people. So, um, you know, we we happy to speak to you all before Christmas, but we will be closed in between the Christmas and New Year period. So um, ju just to make sure sort of that you're all aware that we won't be manning the phones or the email system at that point. So um, please, if you want to get in contact, do contact us before, otherwise there might be a bit of a break until January. Great, thank you, Nikki. Um, so just because a number of you are this live now, but we'll also be having people are listening back. There's usually a few hundred people listening to these meetings um, after after the event, um, and that might be people um, like you living with or caring for someone living with a diagnosis of PCA. It might be a friend or a family member, um, or it might be a healthcare professional who's interested to find out a little bit more so that they can support people they know with PCA a little bit better. Um, so we thought it might be helpful, particularly for those of you joining us for the first time today, just to say a few words about what PCA is, um, with Nikki and I um, just sharing a few thoughts. So perhaps the first quick question, the first quick thing to say is that PCA, just to remind everyone, stands for posterior cortical atrophy, which literally means back of the brain shrinkage. Um, but I think that Nikki, in your experience, people don't always necessarily come to you with those letters in the right order or get told uh, different different labels for their condition. Yeah, quite often we do get people getting the acronym wrong. So I had CPA the other week when, and that was from a health professional, not, not by somebody who was living with or caring for somebody. We have that wrong. We often have people coming to us which just have, uh, an Alzheimer's disease as their diagnosis, but they know that they have different problems to what the general public would see as Alzheimer's disease. So, you know, an atypical Alzheimer's disease, they get told sometimes, or just young onset dementia. So I think it really is that importance of knowing what the disease is, what the acronym is, and what it actually means for you. It, it really helps with people um, to sort of find their way in their support. Absolutely. And the reason we push for people to have the right label is not because we're sort of Puritans or um, sort of neurological stamp collectors. It's because we want you to be able to find the support and the tips and the strategies and other people, most importantly, living with something similar. So another thing Nikki just mentioned there is lots of people get given a generic dementia or Alzheimer's disease diagnosis. And so it's particularly with PCA, it's important to clarify PCA is a description of the problems um, that people experience. 
Um, so it's a syndrome, it's a description of a set of problems, which often, not always, but often start with difficulties seeing what and where things are, but aren't, isn't restricted just to vision. And Kieran, um, Emma, in a few moments, will be talking you through some of the symptoms and things that you can do to help with them. But so with PCA being a syndrome, then we also have to ask, well, what's the cause? What's the underlying disease process that's affecting those brain cells at the back of the brain? And in about 90, 91% of people, we think the cause is Alzheimer's disease. Um, so, and that creates that confusion you're talking about, Nikki, isn't it? Because the, the sort of general public perception of, of Alzheimer's disease is its memory and its older people. And actually PCA affects vision usually first with memory relatively spurred. And um, also is typically a young onset condition. You can be older with it, um, but the average age uh, for starting symptoms is is mid mid to late fifties, um, so that's often a, a confusion, I guess, for people, Nikki, when they come to you for the first time. Oh, absolutely! It's you know the the confusion of what the label is, and quite often if if they've they've come to us and they've been told it's just Alzheimer's disease, they're really sort of bemused why they don't have memory problems as well, and they they don't also um, realize that the visual problems that they are having. It is part of the dementia and, you know, I quite often get told, but I'm fine, my memory's fine. I'm fine. It's just, I can't put my clothes on or I keep bumping into things. Uh, and it's, I think because it's such a very difficult, different symptom to what they've perceived themselves as what dementia is, you know, the, the vision of it being somebody that's very confused, somebody with memory problems. And they did, it hasn't been explained to them properly in the clinic process or, or that may have taken them such a long time to get to that clinic process because they haven't been to the GP. They've been to the optician several times. And we've heard that so many times in the past. Absolutely. Um, another thing I think it's worth saying just before we start the talks is that, as, as I said, posterior cortical atrophy literally means back of the brain shrinkage. But we have to remember that the back of the brain is a pretty big place that supports a whole range of different skills. So as we're going through today, um, and Kira and Emma are describing symptoms, or Charlie's describing some of the people he's worked with and how they've coped, um, or as Felicity and Julia are talking later on, you may hear description of symptoms that you've not experienced yourself. And that's absolutely fine, just to reassure you that there's a lot of variability. Um, depending on which part of the back of the brain is affected first might dictate the symptoms or the, the, the sort of strange experiences that you notice and how your perception and other um, other thinking abilities are affected and obviously sadly these are progressive conditions so and the order in which um, people experience different challenges um, isn't always the same so it's just a reminder that if you hear things that don't quite fit with your experience don't be put off it's because PCA itself is a, is a quite a variable condition in the way that it affects people. The other thing we really want to also emphasize is as much as we'll be talking about words like symptom and loss and impairment um, there's a huge amount of the brain which isn't so affected by PCA. And there's obviously there's all of you as a person, which is remains and persists throughout, um, despite facing the challenges of one of these conditions. So it's really important. And I hope that I hope you'll see from what we're talking about and, and also the way we're talking about the experience of living with PCA today, that it's not just about focusing in on those those symptoms, on those weaknesses, but also focusing on continued strengths and all the many, many things, passions, interests, as well as higher brain cognitive skills that are spared in this condition, which one can make full use of in order to, to live with this condition. And I think that's a sort of that message of kind of empowerment is key to a lot of the advice and support that you you and your colleagues provide, Nikki, is that right? Absolutely. And and we've actually really learned from the experts on this one. And, you know, that's you people out there that are living with PCA. I mean, sometimes I do feel I should be changing the PCA peer support group to, you know, the adaptation group and the empowerment group, um, because we hear so many strategies uh, of things that can help people in their everyday lives within these groups. People are fantastic at sharing. Of, I couldn't do this one day, so I really thought hard of how I can adapt that so I can still enjoy it. Uh, and I think that is it. The, the, the 
key to that is adaptation. Carry on doing what you're doing, but you've just got to do it in a slightly different way. It may take longer. It may be around the houses, but you know that enjoyment is still there. And I think that that's what's so inspiring. What we what we hear within those groups, and that's what we take to share to other people. Yeah, it's a really really important message. And so as we invite um, Keir and Emma onto this to come and join us on the screen now, um, it's just really for us to say ahead of all that you're about to hear a huge thank you to all of your contributions. If you're new to the group, maybe contributions you may make in the future, because every time you tell us about your experiences, that genuinely helps us to help other people um, to help people normalize and understand that what they're going through isn't just them, um, but also to share the tips and strategies um, that Nikki's been talking about and that Emma and um, Kira about to go into in a bit more detail and genuinely to shape the research that we're doing to understand PCA better to understand different other dimensions better through through the window th through the perspective that you generously offer and most of all importantly of all to create community between those of you living with or caring for someone um, living with PCA um, because that's such a vital part of these meetings you won't see that quite so much today because we're online but i really encourage you to try and come along to um, one of our big in-person meetings um, or to join in one of the regular monthly online peer group meetings that nikki's mentioned where you can really get a sense of other people and build friendships with other people going through something similar at a similar time so enough from us um ha we'll hand over to you emma and Keir. thanks so much for being here and we'll let you um, proceed with your talk Thanks for having us. And um, Kia, did you want to just introduce yourself for people who might not already know you? Well, uh, thanks, Emma. Uh, and thanks, uh, Seb and Nikki, uh, for the great introduction. Um, my name's Kia. Uh, I'm a neuropsychologist, uh, similar to Seb. Uh, I'm also an Etherington PCA Senior Research Fellow and the lead investigator for the UCL um, PCA study. Um, Okay, Emma, would you like to do a quick intro? Yes, thank you. Um, so I am a research psychologist, but also an integrative counsellor. Um, and my work is mostly about understanding what it's like for people to live with different types of rare dementia day to day, like PCA, um, but also developing and delivering interventions to help support people in that situation. And I think here you were going to start us off, as Seb mentioned, um, and perhaps especially for anyone who might be joining us for the first time today. Would you mind talking a bit more about some of the difficulties that people with PCA might have that could benefit from some of the strategies that we'll go on to talk about shortly? Sure. Um, and as Seb's mentioned, we're only able um, to talk about things like management strategies and symptoms through people with PCA who shared their experiences of those symptoms. And again, uh, what approaches may have been helpful uh, in order to manage or mitigate uh, some of those consequences of PCA. Um, I should mention that it's been really over the past 10 years that we've been conducting uh, a series of research investigations, essentially to apply our understanding of PCA symptoms to inform ways to better support people living with such symptoms. Um, as Seb's mentioned, uh, it's also worth emphasizing that uh, not everyone is affected by PCA in the same way. Uh, for reasons we don't understand, some people might have uh, differences in terms of their initial symptoms, but also the progression of those symptoms may vary from one person to the next. I, I was going to touch on some particularly uh, common symptoms reported by people uh, as, again, initial signs of PCA. Uh, these can include uh, difficulties with um, object perception and localization. For some individuals, this might include difficulties with recognizing uh, everyday objects. Um, for others, it might include this tendency to miss objects which appear to be right under one's nose. Uh, another uh, common uh, difficulty experienced by people um, includes changes in spatial awareness and sometimes mobility. Now, while some of these issues with, um, for example, recognizing objects can be quite counterintuitive, some of these changes in the spatial awareness can be even harder to describe. Um, some people with PCA have mentioned things such as, it's as if my internal compass feels less reliable. Uh, for others, uh, they might have difficulty with certain aspects of dressing. 
Um, for example, uh, difficulties locating the sleeves of a jacket behind themselves while getting dressed. Or for others, it might be certain buttons, clasps or zips, which are quite difficult uh, to manipulate. For others still, um, an early symptom of PCA can include difficulties with aspects of reading. So commonly this can um, occur as this tendency to become lost in a page of text uh, with individual words jumbling or, or cluttering up. Uh, and finally, uh, for others, uh, people might notice um, some uh, challenges with aspects of hand-eye coordination. So, for example, uh, maintaining um, eye contact with someone over dinner while simultaneously reaching uh, for a glass that's on a busy tabletop. Now, as mentioned, we've learned a great deal about these symptoms um, through research involving people with PCA. I'm happy to discuss um, these in more detail in the Q&A. Thanks, Keir, and I'm sure lots that you've shared there um, resonating with people watching. Um, could you tell us now a little bit about what the research has helped us to understand so far about the different strategies that might be helpful for people with PCA? Thank you, Emma. Um, so to get across some general principles uh, which we've gained an understanding um, of through research, uh, the first we could broadly consider as minimising visual clutter and distracting visual information. So this is something which could be particularly relevant to tasks such as reading, as uh, so for example, minimizing uh, surrounding words, which could be adversely jumbling or cluttering up a, a target word, or something that people might notice is with things like when trying to uh, read a string of digits, it can become particularly difficult um, to recognize digits as you're getting to the center of say, uh, a list of numbers on a credit card. Um, we've applied these findings, the development of assistive technology to promote reading, uh, most notably through the Read Clear app, uh, which people um, you know, were welcome to share further details on. Um, it's also um, uh, been investigated recently through our group uh, that minimizing, again, irrelevant uh, visual information or distracting visual information uh, may be helpful for everyday mobility tasks. For example, supporting people reliably reaching to objects on a busy tabletop by uh, removing or spacing surrounding objects. And also for reducing um, hesitant uh, movements during things like walking by minimizing things like um, a lot of variation in lighting, so a lot of stark shadows as well as glare. Um, another general principle um, for supporting certain everyday tasks is something which is a little bit harder to um, describe, but you could think of it as almost sort of strategic cues or use of reference points. This seems something which is uh, more relevant to uh, managing aspects of spatial awareness, whereas the approach to decluttering might be more relevant to things like aiding object perception or reading. Uh, and everyday examples of this might be, say, a use of visual cues to aid orientation. Um, so people having to um, think less deliberately about where to head to or locate exactly where they might be. Um, for other individuals, this might be use of uh, tactile or haptic, someone might say grasping cues. So everyday examples of this might be, for example, uh, handrails uh, on, on a stair. Um, a last example when it comes to reference points uh, might relate to, say, for some people, experiences of, say, getting up in the middle of the night, it taking that much longer to orientate uh, to where one is. Um, things like, for example, a simple night light to provide some information in order to, again, support that person uh, getting out of their bedroom, or even things like fluorescent stickers, um, say, on, on a light switch. I should also mention that there's a lot of ongoing research uh, which we're um, currently conducting, and this is particularly focusing on what combinations of information from our senses, so not just vision, uh, but sense of touch and body position, enables us to reliably perceive and act upon things in, in our everyday environment. Uh, as a researcher, uh, I should also mention that we're often interested in thinking about what sort of findings are consistent across, say, dozens of people with PCA. But something that Emma, I'm sure, will touch upon is how ultimately in, in everyday clinical practice, we really need to tailor um, any strategies. And we need to tailor them to the individual 
the particular symptoms that that individual is experiencing, the stage of PCA at uh, which they're at, and also the particular task. So I've broadly been talking about things to do with object perception and spatial awareness, but it might be say that something which is helpful for certain aspects of object perception or localization. So let's say it's, I wanna find my toothbrush or my sink and I've left all these say creams and products out that it might help me more reliably located by re removing some of that visual information. But actually for someone else where the issue is particularly say with orientation in quite a sort of, uh, dare I say, um, sort of bland homogenous environment, like a low contrast bathroom where actually some sort of visual cue might be helpful in terms of say, um, uh, determining where it is they've got to go in that setting. Um, that actually you could have uh, almost side effects of overly um, decluttering something for someone who actually needs to have certain aids um, to orientate. Thanks, Kia. Um, and I think I was now going to go on to tell you all a little bit about our plans for a new resource. Um, that we are developing and kind of what we hope this is going to add. Um, so as Kia has highlighted, um, we do already know something about different strategies that might be helpful for people, but often that sort of information that Kia's just shared is buried in kind of academic journals, or perhaps it's been shared with different professional groups, but it's not always easy to access um, for people living with PCA. And also even once you find it, it's not always that digestible um, or easy to find the bit in the long paper that actually is relevant for you and that you want to, to read about. Um, so what we're hoping to do is to make something that's openly available, and that's easy to find your way around so that you can get kind of straight to the strategies that might be most helpful for you um, at any given time. And we also know from conversations with, with members like those of you watching that people don't only want to know about research informed strategies. So when I used to do support calls, I would remember people would often ring and, you know, ask, you know, have you got any tips for helping me to find my way um, to the bathroom. And we'd always be very cautious and, you know, say oh, there haven't been any kind of conclusive studies about um, what might help with that. And people would say, yeah, but do you just know anything anyone else has tried? Um, so that's what I think we really want to capture now. We want to collate what's known from research, but we also want to um, document what's been discovered or even created by people living with PCA and their families. Um, like Nikki was saying earlier, you are really the experts and, and you will all be coming up with lots of creative solutions that I'm sure your peers would really benefit from hearing about. And I suppose linked to that, at the moment, you hearing about a strategy might just depend on whether you make it along to a certain online meeting or face-to-face -face meeting, um, who you sit next to and what they just happen to mention to you. Um, we always have this sense with in-person meetings that there's so much knowledge shared within that room at that time, but it can be hard to make sure it gets beyond the walls of that room as well and um, to everyone who might find it useful. So we really want all that knowledge that's exchanged in those individual conversations to be captured and shareable. And we also want this resource that we make to be evolving so that we consolidate what we know already but that we can continually keep adding things into it as and when people discover them. Um, so we'll also be setting up some kind of process where we can regularly review any new suggestions and ideas. Um, and it sounds like we might definitely need to come along to the peer support group to pick some of those ideas up because it sounds like there's a lot shared there um, every time you're meeting. And Emma, I understand that you might have an early prototype which perhaps you can show people uh, attending the meeting. Yes, thank you. If my tech skills are up to this, I'm hoping to share. Um, here, you'll give me a shout if it if it's gone wrong in some way. Um, but yes, I just wanted to to give you a little walk around um, of the sorts of content we're hoping to share, but also to give you an idea of what that could look like. Um, so this, this is a little prototype of a web-based option that was created by our collaborator, um, Dr. Janneke van Leeuwen. 
And it's one format of possible many. So we'll also look at some low tech options, like perhaps a printable version for people that would prefer something to look through on paper, um, perhaps a PDF booklet is something else we might explore. And we'll go ahead with whatever allows us to share strategies with you soonest, basically. So we'll probably do quite a low tech option and then hopefully upgrade later um, if we can. But just to give you a flavor of, of what kind of information we'll be sharing. Um, we thought here we, people might want to look for strategies in slightly different ways. So for some people, they might want to look by the activity that they're having difficulty with, um, whereas other people might want to look more by rooms or spaces. So if you're someone that thinks, oh, it always seems to be in the bathroom that I run into trouble, perhaps you would want to look at the bathroom strategies. Um, whereas maybe you're someone that thinks, oh, it's usually around meal times that I notice my problems more, then you might want to look at activities um, and these are the different categories that we have um, so far so things like eating and drinking personal care communication spatial orientation and wayfinding relaxation and hobbies housekeeping and gardening using technology and then some general guidelines which will be things that apply kind of across the board um, so just to give you a little walkthrough of the eating and drinking um, the first page we've drafted of, of this one. Um, so there are some strategies that you can see here and there will be pictures to explain and um, to give you a visual idea of, of what this might look like and also some text and some more information if helpful. So the examples here are preparing food that's easier to eat with a spoon and there might be some suggested recipes for example. Um, something else that's been mentioned is people taking with them a brightly coloured travel mug for when they're out and about and having teas and coffees. Um, sometimes in coffee shops, you can get those sort of fancy glass mugs, which we know can be a bit difficult sometimes for people with PCA to see reliably. Um, or also sometimes in those trendy coffee bars, you get those sort of mugs without any handles, which can be tricky to, to pick up and put down um, sometimes. And here we have a strategy that um, some of our research participants developed, which were to put coloured stickers on the different buttons of the microwave um, that this person was using um, to help her continue to microwave her own meals. So you could see here we could read more about this and, and see a little bit about the story of how this strategy was developed. Um, and you could also click on this image if you wanted to see it um, bigger to give you a bit more idea of the detail. And um, so that's really the main things to show you. The other little feature here that we're quite excited about is that you could star any that you strategies that you really like. So we're thinking maybe people would want to keep a record of their favorite strategies so they can come back to them. Um, but maybe people would like to see other people's favorite strategies as well to see what seems to be working for most. Um, I think we also, as Kia was mentioning in sharing these, we'll also want to make lots of kind of disclaimers about how how these can be used. So for example, as Kia said, not everything will work for everyone. We know that. And we also want to help people to try things out safely to figure out what will be most helpful for them. Um, but also like Seb was saying, um, just acknowledging people's different preferences for these kind of things. So a certain strategy might work really well, for example, wearing shoes with a Velcro fastening they might be easier for you to put on, but you also might just not like them as much as your favorite red boots, for example. So it might be that instead we want to think about a different strategy for helping with those red boots. Um, and so just to say it's not about kind of getting this resource, ordering everything in it um, and implementing the strategies in that way. It's much more about figuring out what fits best for you, what you might find most acceptable um, and most helpful. Um, and that's very much, yeah, a guiding principle um, in its development. Thank you so much, Emma, for sharing. And can I ask for people who are interested in further development of this resource, uh, you know, um, what else should they know about it? You know, should they be getting in touch with us? Yeah, so we hope to share a version of it, however drafty that might end up being, um, early next year. And we'll warmly welcome any feedback anyone would like to, to share once they've had a chance to have a look at it. Um, but I should also say that members have already contributed a huge amount to the development 
of the resource in itself and um, by sharing those tips and tricks and um, so we just really want to thank you all as ever for your input and contributions so far but yes we'll, we'll hopefully share something with you early next year um, and also look forward to any questions or suggestions later in the Q&A portion of the meeting as well. Great. Thank you so much, Emma. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you both. Really uplifting to have something so uh, constructive um, and uh, positive and to hear, I lost count of the number of times that the word creative was used in terms of people finding solutions and finding their way around um, or to adapt um, life situations. So really, really helpful, encouraging. Thank you. Um, the next uh, video we have, I believe you will get to see the live Charlie Harrison uh, at the end in the panel discussion. Um, but for now, we have to make do with the recorded version of um, the said same wonderful professional and friend. Um, so this is a little bit from Charlie Harrison giving you a bit of an update um, on creative activity over the last few months. Hi everyone, um, it's really nice to be invited back to the PTA webinar. Um, my name's Charlie and I'm, I have a background as a visual artist, but I've also been working um, with Rare Dementia Support and um, the Dementia Research Centre for about 10 years um, on several different projects um, around creativity and dementia. Um, so for those of you that saw the PTA webinar in August, um, I just gave a quick presentation around a new part of Rare Dementia Support called Rare Space, um, where we're particularly interested in the creative and cultural life of um, RDS members, um, and also sharing new activities, research around creativity, um, and some projects that we've been working on. Um, so I just thought we thought it'd be nice to um, come back and share a little update about what we've been up to since then, um, and also um, invite you to get involved in some of the ideas we've got for 2024 and beyond that as well. Um, so like last time, I'm just going to um, share my screen um, and take you on a little tour through the Rare Space website. So here's the main RDS website, and you can find Rare Space under the Community tab um, at the bottom here. This takes you to um, the microsite, which includes all of the details. And if you want to navigate back to the main RDS site, there's this button that says Return to RDS. Um, at the moment, it's very simple with just a few um, menu tabs at the top. So you can click on the About button if you want to find out more about the background and motivations for this work. Um, so just to quickly scroll through this page, um, we've got more information about the cultural life of RDS. Um, and in particular, we're thinking about what this means um, as we're planning and working towards the new Rare Dementia Support Centre, um, which I'm sure many of you will have heard about. And this centre will be the first ever centre for people living or caring for someone with a rare dementia. And we want to build a culture, space and set of activities that reflects our membership. It's obviously still very early stages, but we want to start thinking about how people might use the space. Um, and we'd really like to hear from you about this. Um, also on this about page, we've got some information about the story so far, which gives, gives some background to the many projects we've been involved with alongside RDS members in the past. And there's also a link to an online course we made about, um, about dementia and the arts, which I can highly recommend. Um, it's had over 18,000 enrolments since it was launched in 2018, so it's really great to see lots of people are engaging with um, dementia in the arts. So there's two other options at the top, which is stories and projects, um, and I've got an update for each one of these. So if we go to stories first, um, and in this section you'll see a selection of stories from our members who have been chatting with to get a better understanding of what creativity means to them. Um, most recently, we've been working with our sister organisation, Rare Dementia Support Canada, um, who have been talking to one of their members who has a diagnosis of PCA. So this is Sonia's story. Um, and in Sonia's story, she tells us about how creative she had been in her life before a diagnosis, um, both in her work and in her free time. She speaks about how um, she has had to adapt in recent years and also how important her friends have been 
um, with the support that they give her. There's also a link to a poem that Sonia wrote um, called PCA and the Single Girl, um, which she wrote as part of a poetry project with RDS. Um, so that's that. I'd encourage you to give that a read. Um, and yeah, I just say, wanted to say really a big thank you to Sonia and her friends for um, helping put this together and also to Jen Gordon at RDS Canada, who's been working with Sonia to share this story. Um, so that's an update there. And then if we move on to projects, um, lots of you will, will have participated over the last four years in the RDS Impact Research Project. Um, and some of you might have done some drawings for this project called the Talking Lines um, project, which involved drawing lines to describe aspects of diagnosis and support. Um, we've been really pleased that some of the outcomes from this research have been part of a public exhibition at the new drawing room gallery um, in their library space, um, and that's in Bermondsey. And we also held a fascinating workshop screening and panel discussion at the end of October. Um, and you can see some of the pictures here. Um, the exhibition is still open until the 10th of December. And there's also lots of other great artwork at Drawing Room Gallery. So I'd encourage anyone that's interested to go along before that ends. Um, over the long term, longer term, one of the main parts of the exhibition, which we hope will be helpful to communicate experiences of rare dementias, is a video which includes some of the drawings and words from people who took part in this research. Um, we've recently added this film um, to this page on the website, and I thought it might be nice to play the first couple of minutes um, today. Um, the first drawing that you'll see is made by someone living with a diagnosis of PCA. Um, and just to let you know that um, the names and um, the voices have been changed for this recording. Right. So it's from when I first noticed things were going wrong with my abilities. And what was that last bit of the question? So from when you first noticed things going wrong to when you got your diagnosis? When I got the diagnosis, yes. Oh, wow. So lots of little lines. Yes, it was like an explosion. It was not an immediate explosion over a period of maybe a year or so where all this was happening and I couldn't understand what was happening. And then as the journey progressed with the assessments and everything, I started to get a little bit of understanding. And then the huge relief, I found it a huge relief when I got the diagnosis. It would have been better to have found out there was nothing wrong with you, but I knew there was something wrong with me and losing all my abilities for everything administrative or numeracy and some literacy, all of those things. I've been self-employed most of my life and all those things that I pretty much lost was everything I needed. So it was massive. That's what those little lines represent with all these little things that came together to make this big thing of the build up. And then when I got the diagnosis, to be relieved, to understand. OK, so that's just a little bit of a taste um, of the Talking Lines project. Um, and if you'd like to watch the whole video, it's about 15 minutes long um, and you can find it on this page. OK. So just to finish up, I just wanted to introduce a few ways you might like to get involved with Rare Space um, in the future. Um, although there's nothing absolutely set in stone for 2024 yet, we do have a few things um, you might like to contribute to or be part of. Um, so the first one, um, as many of you know, the Rare Space Garden won a gold award at the RSH Chelsea Flower Show earlier this year. And it's, it's um, since been relocated to Exbury Gardens in the New Forest. Um, Exbury's actually just closed for the winter, um, but it'll be reopening in the spring. Um, and we'd love to work with some RDS members to engage the public more about um, PCA and gardening for when it reopens. Um, 
So we already have a few ideas involving making clay sculptures, textiles, or recording people's experiences about gardens and gardening. Um, but we're really also really keen to hear your thoughts too. Um, secondly, the Talking Lines project has created a lot of new ideas about drawing and dementia, and there may be opportunities to be involved with further research or engagement projects in this area over the coming years. Um, we're also really interested to hear if you already do a lot of drawing or painting, um, and always interested to see more of the creative things that our members are up to. Um, thirdly, over the past couple of years, we've been working in partnership with an arts organisation called Sweet Patuti Arts to raise awareness of rare and young onset dementias in minoritised communities around the UK. Um, we're hoping to plan some workshops in London, the Midlands and up north um, next year. And this might involve um, things like film screenings, sharing recipes, knitting and textiles. Um, Finally, um, you might like to help us with our plans for the creative and cultural programme for the future at um, the Rare Dementia Support Centre. Um, we currently have really very limited resources for this sort of work, but we are hoping to expand on what we can offer over the coming years. Um, and we're really keen to hear from you about what you would like to be included in the cultural programme. Um, so for now, we would just encourage you to get in touch if you'd like to share your thoughts and ideas. Um, and there may be more ways to contribute as things move forward. Um, so do get in touch if any of this sounds of interest. Um, my email address is up on the screen now, um, and we'll also share some of these slides and resources after the event today. Um, okay, so that's it from me. Um, thanks so much for listening and for inviting me to be part of the event today. Um, I'm really looking forward to hearing from the other um, speakers and also if you've got any questions please do ask um, wonderful well thank you so much charlie we'll get to thank uh, charlie in a moment and ask him some further questions about uh, his previous current and planned work uh, which is all very exciting um just one comment or in the q a box that came in in relation to emma and Keir's um presentation but relevant to what charlie was just sharing there as well with someone just saying given reading difficulties in pca can you add audio files for tips and strategies and also i think for creative stories on your website so that people with pca or their carer can listen to it so yes absolutely um as i think charlie just showed with that video it's obviously really powerful sometimes to listen to hear some of these um uh, these ideas and these experiences and stories uh, voiced by other people so that's absolutely um, part of the plan of our website overhaul to share more of the material that we have in a way that's more accessible for people with PCA so um, watch this space we're on it and please do chase us if you don't think we're making fast enough progress so thank you so much right uh, now we're going to have another video and it's this time um, it's uh, Karen one of the RDS team um, who will be introducing you to uh, Felicity and Julia, um, who are going to be telling you a little bit about their experiences of um, living with PCA um, and some of the tips and strategies that they would recommend um, from their experience. So over to them. Good morning, everybody. I'm absolutely delighted to be here today with Felicity and Felicity's wife, Julia. Welcome to you two. Hello, thank you. Hello. Lovely to see you both. Um, thank you so much for joining us um, today. We're going to have a chat about tips and strategies for everyday activities um, when you're living with PCA. So Felicity, you have a diagnosis of PCA. I do, yes. Can you tell us about the main issues that affect you that are caused by PCA and how these affect your daily life and what adaptations that you've made at home? That's quite a short question. Um, the main <laughs> issues, the main issues are um, visual perception, um, which I think most people with PCA get, and it's um, the way it affects us uh, many ways, sadly. But it's things like making a cup of tea, and there is this wonderful little uh, thingy called um, something. But it's oh, this is the camera. Sorry. There we go. Yeah, and when you put hot water in the mug, um, it starts going bzzz when you get too near the top. That's effectively what it does, which is amazing. Um, so 
reading is another biggie was another biggie for me and still is to a way and that is um that i have two kindles which i can enlarge the print in and that is helps me because i can still hold a kindle albeit not a book um and um there was something else i was going to say sorry mm. uh, it's gone. Right, okay that's the memory loss um <laughs> just come in there um telling the time was quite a shock when i looked at a clock and found that i couldn't actually tell the time on it um so now i have a a watch that talks to me if I press a certain knob and it tells me the time, the date, the year, everything. So it's quite good. Um, and my medication, I keep in a set order. So it's the same every day rather than just sort of having it all in a jumble. And it does work that. Um, and um, I have an alarm on my phone, which I've set up, or my wife has. Um, which tells me when it's certain times of day for taking other tablets, which aren't just morning and night tablets. Um, is the other thing that's affected me in that way is is I've had a fear. I have a fear of going out on my own, and because a lot of people are much braver than me, they get the training of the long cane, which is the long white stick with a ball on the end, um, and they go out or they have a guide dog, and you should see them whizzing around the roads. I think whoa, um, and they're amazing people, um, but. I'm not that amazing in the sense that I, it has taken away my independence and self-esteem, but that's just me. Um, a lot of other people have ways of, of working it, controlling it, whatever, not PCA, but controlling how their life is. Um, and I suppose the things of um, walk in shower, am I at that stage yet? Yeah. Um, we, had a, we had a bath and we just had the walk in shower put in and it has a grab rail. grab rail in it and it's really amazing it's so so useful it means i can actually have a shower every day um cooking i don't cook so i don't have that problem <laughs> for those of you that do i'm really sorry um uh, blah, 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 blah. i the layout of the house um what i did for a little while not often but i did for a while was close my eyes so i couldn't see anything and I tried, well, I tried, I worked my way around the house so that if my eyesight's bad one day, then at least if I my eyes, I've got that bit more and I can then get around the house on my own, can't I? Yes, you can. Um, um, but explain how your white cane helps you when you're out. What, what was happening before you learned how to use a white cane? Um, I wasn't going out. I was falling over. Um, tripping on curbs and yeah. potholes. Mm, yeah. Um, um, so that does help. But it's really I only feel safe, as I said, with Julia, which is a tie on her, I know. But I will use my white cane out now, um, but not on my own. I just, I'm, maybe it's because I'm 73 and very old, but I really don't have the, you know, whatever. Um, so, and then there's other things that when you do go out, like, um, what are they called? There's these traffic lights, there's traffic lights for Pelican. going over the road. Um, Pelican crossings. Pelican crossings, that's the word I want. Um, and underneath them, not every single one, but a lot of them, they have, if you put your hand underneath them, which looks weird, but there's something, a little knob underneath, which is sort of like a rubbery feeling, isn't it? Yeah. And when the lights have gone green, okay, there's a noise there, but you also get this feeling of, it sort of buzzes. buzzes on your finger. And then you know it is safe to walk over the road. And I think that's a lot of people, I'd never heard of that before. And I think a lot of people don't know. And I think it's a really handy one to have. Or to know, let's put it that way. Go on. So stairs. Stairs. Um, we have now um, two handrails going up and down the stairs. Well, obviously. Um, but at the bottom of one, my wife very cleverly, because she is, um, uh, found what was it? An old a wooden door drawer handle, which I've and, screwed. And then she screwed that to the bottom of it. So when I'm getting near the bottom of the stairs, my hand touches this. And I know I've only got one or two steps to go, which is which is also helpful. It's, it stops you having to look down the stairs. Yes, which is also helpful. Yeah. <laughs> and I think sense. Felicity, you said that you've had some of the um yellow and black hazard tape on the stairs as well to help with that perception of coming the, down the stairs. These 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 are the outside steps. Ah. So um and we again with it by from Ali, my lovely lady, she um 
suggested that we had either yellow or orange, or orange painting Paint. uh, painted on about that wide if anybody can see that on the step and then you've got that focus either going up and down the steps mm. um because the, the reason one of the reasons i had that was because before i was diagnosed with pca i fell down said steps and i broke both my elbows so you really don't want that it's, it's a vital you get something like that there um and also i've had a um, railing put up now to go into the garden at the back and we've had we had railings in the front haven't we to get, yes. in, to get up the path so they're all all things that make you feel safe but yeah they make me feel much safer i must admit um yeah. and i think so, there'll be a lot of people at home felicity sort of nodding at the webinar at the screen going oh me too all of those yeah that you've mentioned as symptoms that you experience living with yeah. PCA. Um, I really like the little um, sensor that you had on the yeah. mug so that you keep independent and you can make a cup of tea. Mm. It, that's absolutely fantastic. And drink it. I'm a tea um, yeah. um Also, on, on the sliding doors, we have a sliding um, conservatory, of conservatory, whatever it is, patio Passion. doors. Um, we have um actually if no, you lift that well, up no because it's the, i'm not sure oh, okay um we have dra um, dragonflies transfers. In transfers all over it so that i don't go smack which i have done as well um and that really works as well because there's even if you can't see the dragonflies there's still a shadow there which yeah. you know would make you stop hopefully <laughs> but it does mean um and i've sorry I just think the the layout of your home as well, what you said about closing your eyes and walking around there and then mm. keeping everything in the same place is really, yeah. really helpful as well, isn't yes, it? Yes, it is. It is. Um, and also, um, I've got uh, an armchair, which is the same colour as the carpet. So what we've done is we put a red throw on it so that that differentiates, obviously, between the two. Um, and mm. we've also got throws on the sofa haven't we as well yeah. um so and and oh, uh, what else come on you think of something well felicity <laughs> can i jump in there you know i think you said that you've really struggled um to tell the time and you said that was really quite frightening the first time yes, it was it was you feel but you're losing everything but i've got one of these and i'll tell you the time there we go oops can't <laughs> see it but there we go did you hear that yeah perfect Good, brilliant and does that make you feel safer being able to access that information? Yes, it does, because I've always been somebody that looks at the time and so on. Um, um, time freak, maybe not, I don't know. But anyway, so I, yes, it's good to have that as far as I'm concerned. Or if I wake up in the night, then I can, under the bedclothes, sort of put it on, I can hear it. And then I know, oh, no, it's not time to get up yet. <laughs> so, you know, go back to sleep, hopefully. Um, Thank you. And also, you mentioned about the sensory team being involved it was just before your diagnosis of pca yes it was and the support um, they offered I, you it was amazing i don't think there are many sensory people that are um with every council no with every council because i can remember ali saying to me that you know there weren't them all over the country and i said it's a real shame because they are an absolute boon mm -hmm. um as i say she taught me how to use my white cane she was somebody who would listen to me we, we would go out to different places, uh, you know, sort of like the park and stuff for me to use, practice the game. Um, and also and, lots of different gadgets, which we tried in the early yeah. days. But and when, when they weren't any good, not, not any good, but when they weren't right for me, then we obviously let her have them back. But I can remember when um, she first heard that, or, that I had the um, diagnosis and she was in shock and I could tell um, because she only ever had one person that she'd ever dealt with before. Mm -hmm. And um, so she's she very kindly still rings me once a month just to see how I am. It's not part of a job, but it is, and we just have a bit of a chat. And then you know, but she has been so supportive, and it's a shame they haven't got them all over the country. Um, well, we do have sensory teams, but again, it can be a bit of a postcode lottery. But they should be with all the local authorities around the country, and you can yeah, they should, them, they really should um, yeah. through the social care team. But I think the lovely thing that you told me earlier was how she taught you how to use the rolling cane, so you no longer had to look down anymore and could enjoy mm. it outside. Yeah, yes. I mean, it takes some practice, I must admit, but once you get used to it, because it's the rhythm of it, obviously, as well, which is. I said, I can remember saying to her, I'm never going to get this. And she said, yes, you will. And of course you do. And it becomes second nature. 
So it's, it's it sounds awful to have to have a white stick, but actually it's not. It's a, it's a great boon. It's your eyes on the road. Yeah, and, and on the pavement. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Let's turn our mind to hobbies. So, you know, what hobbies um, do you have and, and what adaptations have you had to make since the diagnosis? Uh, well, with, with things like tapestries and knitting, that's a no-no. Um, as I said earlier, the, the, uh, with reading, I've got my Kindles. Um, and, and with my music, I've got Alexa because I can't read the CD covers. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we just sort of... I don't know. We get through somehow, yeah. don't we? And you, you read, you read the newspapers on the BBC website, and mm. you can stretch. Yes, you can. Them so you can then read them. Yeah. And yeah. we go, we're, yeah. Um, so it's, mm. And that's working for you at the moment. Yes, it is. Yes. And um, and I don't know because I don't know. I mean, I only saw as you know some the consultant after thirty months of waiting, which I don't want to put people off, but. When it does happen, it's worth it. I had a memory test with him. Mm. That was quite scary, I'll be honest. Um, because he said to me, what day is it? And I got the wrong day. It was crazy. You know, and you, you don't believe that your mind is doing that sort of thing. Um, but he's put me on some tablets, which I um, can't remember what they're called now. Done matter. something. Doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, and they're meant to not regress because it's never going to be cured. Obviously, we know that. But just help. Brain function. Get it. Get a bit. Get a bit back, if you like. I think that's what we're putting. Yeah. Get a bit of the brain back for however long. It can help and be supportive, can't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. For some yeah. people. Mm. Thank you so much, guys, for you know coming in and having a conversation with me today. There's been so many tips and strategies in there. I just feel that so many of our members will just be nodding at home, going, "Me too." I didn't realise it was just me. So thank you so much for sharing all of those. And I know that you're both going to come and join us in the next few moments or so to the panel. Um, and Seb will be hosting that. And I'm sure there'll be some questions for you about some hints and tips that you'll be able to share with our members. Okay. So thank you guys so much for coming along today and having this chat with me. Is there anything before we close up, because we've got another minute or so that you would like to leave and share with the group today? I think um, it's, um, sorry. I think it's um, just don't let don't let it get to you totally. I know it can do. I'm aware of that. But there are ways around different things. And it's finding those out more than letting yeah. it get you down. We have a, a game with uh, Felicity's great nieces that if Felicity mm -hmm. forgets a word, they have to guess what the missing word is when we face time. They're only nine and 11 and they don't know what, what this is yet. And I hope they don't for a while. But yes, it was a game I sorted out for last Christmas. I thought of, and I said to my nieces, "That or Yeah, it's a great idea." And they thought it was great fun, didn't they? Yeah. Look yeah. at GBA. They call me GBA. Look at GBA. She she can't she can't remember that word. Yeah. Will you help me then, kids? You know, and it worked. And it's if everybody can sort of think up little things like that, it's it can help. Have a sense of humour, um, <laughs> and and actually um, the PCA peer support groups are great both for yours and as a carer there's one for me and actually facebook there are a couple of really good facebook support groups for carers in particular yeah um, i want to just jump in there and just say i am so lucky to have felicity who's been coming for a year now to um, our pca peer support group a very valued member um, and it's a delight to um, share some time with Felicity every month. And you share some amazing strategies at those monthly meetings, Felicity. Thank you so Thank you. much. Right. We better draw this to a close and hand it okay. back to Seb. Thank you so much again, both of you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Bye. Bye. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. As Karen said, uh, uh, Felicity and Julia will be joining us again in a moment. Um, but thank you not just for the huge number of uh, creative tips and ideas and solutions, which, as Karen mentioned, lots of people will have been nodding along to or thinking, oh, let's try that. But also the sense of inspiration, in which I don't, I don't say lightly, but it's often the case that people, particularly when you're living with something big and making having to make lots of changes um, because of something like PCA, there's a difference between a good idea 
and a good idea that you can face, that you can accept, and that you can put the time and the effort into using and making use of. And so particularly helpful for those, those of us perhaps with slightly lower energy levels um, than, than uh, Felicity was just exhibiting there. Really inspiring to have to hear of someone who's put the effort in you were talking about for example with the roller cane it's not instantly a fix or in, isn't instantly helpful but I think Felicity was saying about by putting practice into it and um, giving it some time that it actually became second nature so I just wanted to acknowledge that these when we make these recommendations for tips and advice we don't do it lightly and we know that there's a lot that goes with that and so it's helpful to not just hear the good ideas but see um, how that can be put into practice in real life uh, I'm really encouraging. Thank you. Um, so just before we move on to the panel discussion, uh, just going to give you a short uh, video uh, with Emily Brotherhood um, telling you a little bit about some uh, current research opportunities. Thanks everyone for having me here today. And um, for some of you, I'm becoming a very familiar face in seminars and webinars, as I've spoken about this research uh, with you before. However, this is the last chance to take part in this piece of research. And so we will run through one final time as a reminder, and for anyone here today who may be coming to the webinar for the first time. So my name is Dr. Emily Brotherhood, and I'm speaking to you all this morning as part of the team doing research into designing better online support for PCA, and crucially to ask for your help. As part of an upcoming research project, we're designing new online support programmes, one for people living with PCA and one for family and friends of people with PCA. We're making these programmes to be delivered online so that they can reach more people and so that you can access the information within the programme day or night. But we understand that making support group programmes that are accessed online only can have its challenges. The more technical issues, the less likely it is that the programmes will be used, for example. And so we want to minimise these challenges and learn from your success stories and what's worked well for you before when you've been finding out information about PCA or accessing PCA support about you or your loved one's health online. The more people we hear from at this stage, the more we can learn from different perspectives of the lived experience of PCA, which means we can use this information to tweak how we make these support programmes, which truly puts you and your loved one's needs at the heart of its design. So how you can help us is you can tell us about your experience of accessing health information online by completing a survey. There are three different links available depending on your lived experience. So there's a survey firstly for a person with a diagnosis of PCA, a second survey for any family member or friend listening um, who lives with or knows a person with PCA, and thirdly for any healthcare professionals in the audience who may be supporting someone with PCA. The survey takes approximately 10 minutes to complete and will ask you questions such as your internet use and preferences in accessing health information, your attitudes towards web-based resources, so how well you like using things like Zoom, and some questions about your general health and well-being, your views about security and privacy online. I'm delighted to say that to date we've heard from 380 people with an experience of rare dementias such as PCA and this is 99% of our target as we're trying to reach 385. So we are very, very close to reaching our 385 target by Christmas. And so we would really appreciate any of you interested in taking part to respond to this survey. The links for the surveys will be available in the follow up email that will come around to you after the webinar has taken place. The last thing for me to say is a huge, huge thank you to those of you listening who are considering taking part between now and Christmas. And of course, to those of you listening who have already taken the time to complete the survey. We look forward to hearing your responses and we will come back to let you know our findings. Thank you very much. Great. So there you are. Last, last, last orders on the uh, participation in that particular study. If I could welcome um, everyone onto the screen who's joining me for the panel now, that'd be great. Um, in particular, I think you will recognize all of the faces except uh, Ross Patterson. Ross, great that you can join us. Um, I'm just wondering if you could possibly slightly rotate your, uh, we've got the bright window behind you, which given there we are, perfect. Glare, a glare-free Ross, that's what we like. Uh, Ross, would you care to just introduce yourself briefly um, before we start the questions? Is that okay? 
Yeah, thank you very much for having me. It's a while since I've been at one of these meetings, so it's nice to be back. So yeah, I'm I'm a consultant neurologist um, based at the Dementia Research Centre, um, but I also run a clinic in Kent for the southeast of England um, for young onset and rare dementias. Um, and part of my work is also doing research and um, running clinical studies to understand mechanisms of dementia. Um, but also I'm leading a study trialing a new treatment um, for um, Alzheimer's disease. Brilliant. Well, great to have you with us, Ross. Thank you so much for taking the time. Um, so we've had a number of questions through already, um, for which thank you very much. Um, but just to say we can happily take some more, um, either to answer now or later. So if you um, have a, either a response to any of the talks that you've heard, uh, a question triggered by one of the talks you've heard, um, or a general query or, or wondering, um, please do feel free to share it in the Q&A box and we'll try and get through as many as we can. Um, given the focus of this meeting on, on tips and strategies, there are obviously uh, lots of questions about that, but also some more general um, research, medical and other questions, which I'll sort of drop in as we go through, if that's OK. And I thought we perhaps um, might start um, with a couple of those, if that's all right. Um, perhaps to come to Keir and Ross first, one question um, that came in um, was um, about whether transcranial magnetic stimulation has ever been used um, in PCA. And I wondered, Kiros, if in the most lay terms, you might care to say a little bit about uh, what that is um, and whether you're aware of any usage of that kind of therapy or intervention in people with PCA. And I, I will use the usual chair's metric of how hard is the question by seeing how how speedily or slowly people unmute in their eagerness to tackle these questions. Thanks, Seb. Um, so uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation or TMS uh, is a tool which has been used uh, routinely in a number of uh, well research studies, uh, essentially to alter patterns of brain activity. Uh, I'm not an expert on the technique, uh, but my colleague, uh, Dr. Matthew Brancroft, who I think some people who are taking part in PCA research may have met, he works at the department, which I think it's fair to say has pioneered a lot of different TMS techniques. Uh, in short, I'm not really aware of any dedicated um, uh, TMS work that's been conducted uh, in uh, uh, people with PCA. Uh, Ross, I don't know if you're familiar with any, again, sort of um, what well, brain stimulation uh, techniques. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree with that, Kieran. There's always a really broad spectrum of research going on. And as a kind of clinical translational researcher, um, when things become interesting in clinical populations and show real promise, we tend to hear about them. And it's not something in my radar that's... Um, that, that's kind of past that bar um, that's been used in specific um, types of, of dementias. So um, I'm definitely not an expert, but I, as far as I know, that that hasn't been introduced in, in PCA. I guess as a, as a minor point, so um, we can think of brain stimulation techniques. We can also think of sensory stimulation techniques. Uh, and I am aware of, again, use of different techniques to stimulate the senses of people PCA, but more for um, assessment purposes and also to understand some of the symptoms that we've been talking about earlier. And I think there may be a couple of questions in the chat relevant to understanding so-called, again, uh, altered, um, yes, uh, interpretation of information from one's senses. Great, thank you both. And I guess in this new era of potential new era of disease modifying therapies, then in future, we may also use different types of therapy, both drugs, kind of physiological interventions like uh, like this electrical stimulation and the, the more behavioral or, or social interventions that Keir's mentioned in combination in the future. So it, it, even if those studies haven't been done yet, just to encourage you that we will continue to keep you abreast of um, research developments as we go on with these regular meetings. Um, thank you both. Um, couple of other quick questions. Um, well, I don't know if they're quick questions, but um, slightly on the clinical end um, relating to the eyes. Uh, one is uh, someone describing um, in the person they look after who has PCA um, them having an experience of extreme burning eyes. They say this person does also have severe rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and so the question is, could the um, 
could the soreness or burning sensation in the eyes be, in any way be related to PCA? Is it likely to be the arthritis or something else, uh, or perhaps a combination? Just a reminder that we, we t tend not to do sort of direct clinical advice in some of these things we sometimes pick up on afterwards, but just in, in general terms, whether anyone's um, heard of that before. Keir or Ross, would you care to come in on that one? Keir, I, I don't know if you want to say anything specifically about this in PCA. It's not, it's not a symptom that I recognise people um, talking about um, burning eyes, but I would say just with my kind of general medical hat on that patient, you know, rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune disease and that there are crossover diseases with other autoimmune diseases that cause dry eyes. And there's a specific syndrome that can, um, as a consequence of rheumatoid arthritis, it could give dry eyes. So I would probably be thinking about tackling that and getting advice from a rheumatologist um, rather than assuming that that's due to PCA. Thank you. That's really helpful. And another one um, uh, is about someone mentioning about someone with PCA having cataracts or having been told they've got cataracts um, and the possibility of cataract surgery to remove those cataracts has been raised. I'm wondering if there's any experience of whether that, that kind of procedure is, is helpful or, or worthwhile going through. Keir, I think you have some experience of that via the College of Optometrists and some of their studies. Thanks. And I think it follows on a bit from Ross's point as well, where, you know, unfortunately, people with PCA can both have, again, essentially a brain sight issue. So an issue with particularly the back of the brain interpreting visual information from the eyes, as well as an eye condition that while, again, the symptoms of PCA can't be interpreted or explained by an eyesight issue, you can have people who have both. And it's, again, to do with both um, having age as a particular risk factor. Um and I think it's fair to say that, yes, you know, you'd certainly want to address uh, cataracts if, you know, they're affecting uh, someone's vision. You want to make sure that the information that's coming from the eyes is in, you know, the best quality possible. And this is also relevant for other um, eye conditions, for example, macular degeneration. So a recurring issue that many people with PCA face is if someone's trying to assess visual acuity and you have this acuity chart where it's quite difficult for some people moving between one line to the next, or as you're getting towards the center of the chart, when you've got all the surrounding, again, items or letters, it can become harder to pick out something in the middle that's flanked by all this other visual information. And it, be it can become harder to assess uh, something like visual acuity reliably. But it's important to be able to do that for someone who's got macular degeneration and you're evaluating how they're responding, say, to a treatment. And that's something we worked on uh, with the College of Optometrists and Moorfields Eye Hospital is improving uh, visual assessment uh, for people who have uh, PCA. Great. Thank you so much, Keir. Um, Felicity, did I see your, your hand up? Did you have a comment on cataracts? Or... Yes, I, I had a cataract removed about a year before I was diagnosed, and that was when really the problems with sight were coming out after the cataract was done. And I was convinced at the time that something had gone wrong with my cataract, but obviously that I was wrong with that, and it helped eventually with the diagnosis of PCA. So, yeah. Great, thank you so much. Um, shifting tech a little bit as a sort of interesting mixed bag of questions. Um, one question that's come in, which is, I guess, a general one, perhaps any, any of you may care to, to speak to, um, but particularly um, Emma and Nikki, perhaps, um, is, is there a particular order of deterioration? Someone is asking about kind of how to know what to expect. Um, not so much in terms of time span, but in terms of the symptoms or difficulties that might be um, might be experienced. And I guess Felicity and Julia, you may have, may have comments on this as well. And should I start? Well, I suppose the answer to that is yes and no. <laughs> and listening to everyone, we all have to sort of realise everybody is very different. We see very similar um, symptoms coming in from people. Um, you know, trouble with getting dressed, uh, trouble with seeing the stairs, as, as Felicity said, things like that, um, problems sort of with mugs and things like that, and, um, and visual problems reading. But we also sort of, especially when we're in the groups, we do hear quite a variation of symptoms that are coming in that, that aren't spread across the group. 
And I, I think, and I always do warn people sort of within the groups, this may not be happening to you. It may not happen to you at all, or it may happen in a different order. So I, I, I do really appreciate everybody wants to be prepared for what's coming next and would almost sort of like this sort of list of what to tick off with it. But um, sometimes it is in a slightly sort of different order as well for people. Emma, you've done quite a lot of sort of research with this. Yeah, so I think exactly as, as Nikki's saying, there's definitely that want to know what might happen when, but then there's also that difficulty of having to say, you know, it's different for everyone. Um, but I think that has driven us over a number of years now, and some of you may have completed it, we've been doing a survey about the different stages of PCA, and that's been in various different iterations um, to try and find out yeah, any general patterns we can about how those things progress and, and what things are commonly seen. Um, and actually, in the last iteration of that, we added in um, a question about each stage um, in terms of what people found helpful to do at that stage. So again, bringing in the strategies. Um, I don't know, Seb, if you're able to update at all, or Kia, on, on where that is or, or next steps for that, but it's definitely something that we, we know is a need and, and we're working on collating and sharing that information. Thank you, yes, um, Kia, I don't know if you want to comment, but um, just to say that will hopefully be um, available in the next couple of months. And yeah, the real the real change there was not only updating it and getting more people um, to give their views about um, what was missed previously um, and, the, and the rate of change, um, although it's always different for every person, but also to add in a few more of the less commonly um, talked about, particularly sensory symptoms, and also some of the psychological and psychiatric symptoms um, that can be, that can accompany it. Uh, Felicity and Julia. I, I just wanted to say that quite often, um, a few years before one knows one has PCA, you're having these, these things happen to you and you have no idea why. And, and that's strange because nobody can give a um, reason. Yeah, reason for it. Um, like I was always, um, several because I got this late, um, much later than normal. Uh, I think it was about 70 minutes, whatever. But uh, I used to take the dogs for a walk before all this happened. And I was aware that I was zigzagging down the road. And if anybody had seen me from behind, it was I was drunk um, and things like that. And then when I fell, um, down the garden stairs and broke both my elbows. Then it started, it you know, and realizing what something must be wrong. So somebody help me because it, you know I was bumping into things and so on. So I think it is the fact that it is the fact that a lot of these things happen before it's diagnosed. And I know obviously that helps in a way for the diagnosis, but sometimes it can be quite a long time to get the diagnosis, especially up north. Just to, you know. <laughs> but you know, it is it, it can be difficult initially. But there are ways around it. And I think that's the plus thing about it all. Yeah, absolutely. And I think one one person particular, Charlie, I was going to come to you in a moment to perhaps say how some of the people you've worked with have kind of adapted their their kind of creative passions as as things have, have developed or new symptoms have emerged. But I know that one of the words that people have we I've personally found most helpful is hearing people talk about recalibration in that in the sense it's difficult to know what's a big issue and sometimes something that was a big issue or, or something you particularly wanted to focus your efforts in trying to tackle um perhaps a few months or a year or so later doesn't seem like the top priority and you've kind of re recalibrating to a different a different challenge um so it's not just a sort of a, a sliding scale these, these are sort of fresh fresh challenges that come along which require sort of new and creative thinking Charlie, I don't know if it's mirrored in your experience with how people engage in different creative projects as well. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I suppose there's um, this element of learning new things as well that's come out of the conversation a bit today. Like so sometimes maybe there are things that you did before that are now more difficult, but then there's also opportunities there to to try new things as well. And and yeah, pe people have definitely come up with some interesting strategies um, creatively. Um, someone who made paintings would rotate their canvas because they, they were struggling to work in the center of the canvas and found that rotating and working around the edges was much easier 
Um, another person I've spoken to would tape off areas to sort of avoid some of that visual clutter element that Kia was speaking about earlier. Um, someone even was having problems manipulating their hands um, for for using like a brush or a pencil or thing. So I actually found that strapping the brush to their wrist was more more helpful. Again, these things aren't necessarily going to be like across the board, but um, I think it speaks really to the fact that um, creativity exists not just in the thing that you're sort of making, but also in the way you're approaching it. Um, and of course, some people also have just found that um, working in a more abstract way um, with what they're doing or like um, in encouraging other senses like touch and things like that might might be sort of quite pleasing in itself. Um, and also th there's always a sort of community aspect with this work as well, working with other people um, to help find solutions as well, um, which I think speaks a lot to what's been said today. Great, thank you. It's really, really helpful sort of general principles that apply not just to those creative projects, but to wider life. Thank you. Um, Emma and Nikki, I just wanted if I could come to you because a couple of the other comments and questions have come in, particularly from um, those who are supporting someone who at a more advanced stage of PCA, where um, uh, perhaps a number of these tips and strategies have been helpful, but have perhaps slightly had their day. And so for people who are perhaps based in a chair more now and who are finding interacting much more difficult, wondering whether the resources um, and the tips, and whether there are other tips and strategies that can be shared and helped um, for people in those more advanced stages of their condition. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so one, I suppose one of the, we were talking with the strategies about different ways of dividing them up and different ways you might want to look through them. And I think that stage is another category that we might want to organize things by. And I could imagine, um, yeah, there's slightly different modifications and recalibrations of different techniques for different stages. And um, so that could certainly be something we want to think about when we when we organize those strategies. Um, and I think a lot of those guiding principles we've been talking about, you know, who the person is and things they're interested in and um, finding different ways to engage with those things. That's something that happens at the very earlier stages and also is something um, that probably continues into the more advanced stages as well. Um, so, yeah, certainly be looking to capture some examples of what those could look like. Um, I don't know, Nikki, if you wanted to say anything about the later stage provision in general um yeah I think so yeah thanks Emma and I completely agree sort of collecting sort of people's ideas but sort of with the late stages sort of understanding as well as the disease progress and people getting tired a lot quicker that you know having large activities or long activities aren't going to be suitable and sort of managing time sort of for short bursts of really stimulating activities and using the senses a lot more as well you know especially sort of found fantastic smells and touches so aromatherapy um massages um hand massages and especially sort of this time of year when you know coming up to christmas instead of be people going out to do things bringing that into the home and we do that at christmas all the time we have christmas trees we have wonderful smelling sort of pine potpourri around and things like that but being able to use those smells to use these activities within the home regularly sort of throughout the year in different ways they're using a lot of um sort of more care home facilities a sort of namaste approach where they are looking at using the senses in very short bursts through the day um to do sensory activities with people and it really does make that difference of doing small bits regularly rather than doing a large sort of, I don't know, interactive session, which is going to be so overstimulating to someone that it's not going to be beneficial. So I think it's really looking at people's routines of their days as well and when they're going to be in a, in a better sort of position to do some activities and some small bursts within those. So again, it's adapting, but it's it's. I think this is a big adaptation for carers as well of of actually realizing, you know, we now have to change sort of what we can do here. Great, thank you. Here, did you have a comment before we move on? Yes, I just thought to share. I think this was from the last PCA support group meeting I attended in person before um COVID. Uh, that upon asking support group members uh, what they found helpful, uh. 
one person said this is a carer of someone with PCA um, that what he had found most helpful was three things. Um, so in late stages, investing in a very nice or some, something like a cashmere jumper, controlling drafts and not trying to walk into the wind. And I was thinking at this point, you know, what were people with PCA for 10 years? And not, none of those I'd heard shared before, but I think they speak to something Nikki and others have touched on, where it can be the importance of other senses. And again, to put a research hat on, there is some suggestions that as vision becomes less reliable over time, some of the senses can perhaps become more important. But even within vision, we know that not all aspects of vision are equally affected by PCA. So say for some people, it might be color vision is relatively spared. It appears that things of a certain color take on a particular significance to that person, even if it's difficult making sense about a lot of the other visual information around it. Great, thank you. Okay, really, really helpful. We've had a swell of questions, so sincere apologies if we don't get them through them. A couple of quick practical ones for Emma and Nikki. One was, when is the Living Well with PCA resource going to be available? And Nikki, for you, how would you like people to um, find out more or get directed towards um, some of the types of support groups, particularly the peer support groups um, or local support groups that have been mentioned during the meeting? I take on this, the, tackle the support and the support groups. So any questions you have and you don't know where to direct it, just please always use the contact at rarededementiasupport.org email because that will come in and we will funnel it. So even if it's to Keir or Ross or anyone else and you don't know their email, it, if it comes through to us, we will funnel it the right way. But I can certainly help people with the peer support groups and the regional groups that we that we have and you know we hope to set up in the future. We've just streamlined our peer support groups. So now all the peer support groups for those of you that are living with a diagnosis are on a Monday and the peer support groups for those caring for are on a Wednesday. But if you give me if you send me an email at that email address, I'll be able to give you the uh, correct details. Make sure you've got a support call beforehand and you know what the groups are going to in entail. And um, just in terms of the resource, so we're hoping to share something by the spring. Um, it might be slightly delayed while we work in all of the things Felicity mentioned, because I've been <laughs> scribbling those down. There were so many suggestions in there um, for us to add in. Um, so yes, by the spring, and I know the question was also about how to find out about it. it if you found out about today's webinar, you'll find out about that because we'll share it in the same way. So via the RDS communications. Um, so yes, you won't miss it. Wonderful, thank you. In the couple of minutes that are left, I'm sorry to do this to you, Ross and Keir, a couple of questions that have winged away, their way into us include, um, is there a genetic risk of getting PCA? And also, is there any updates on the Alzheimer treatment drugs, the Canamab and Denanamab um, that either of you could share? Perhaps I could talk a little bit about risk and then Ross can uh, take care of update on anti-amyloid immunotherapies and any other, um, again, uh, clinical trials currently ongoing. Um, so I think that the key message regarding risk for PCA is that, again, the biggest risk factor is going to be age. And for all intents and purposes, the PCA syndrome itself, as Seb put it, doesn't appear to run in families. There's also some suggestions that slightly confusingly, that while uh, the strongest genetic risk factor associated with Alzheimer's disease is also associated with PCA, that the so-called risk effect associated with PCA is actually a bit smaller for PCA than more typical memory-led Alzheimer's disease. So uh, again, but the key message is PCA doesn't appear uh, to run in families. Excellent. Thank you, Ross. Uh, I'll respond specifically. I think someone's written a question in the chat about when lucanumab and denanumab are likely to be ruled out in the UK. So the, I think I would see this as being in three stages. So the first stage is the UK MHRA. So that's the board that oversee the safety of medicines and they decide whether it's suitable for a, a medicine to be adopted. Um, and the result of that's expected early to middle of next year. There's then the next question of whether NICE, which is the organization that recommends whether a treatment is value for money. And so that is a separate process that will follow on from the MHRA recommendation. And then there's the question of practically 
how does one roll that out um, in, in, in practice? And, you know, these drugs are given intravenously in infusion suites regularly. And quite honestly, the NHS does not have the capacity to roll this out. Um, there's also a question of how are people going to be diagnosed and do we have the tools to diagnose people? So I think it's going to be a while. And um, I would say to people not to get their, their, their hopes up. Um, and if we look at what's happening in the States, um, you know, they're a couple of years ahead of us in terms of the regulatory approvals. And in clinical practice, very few people are actually receiving this. Thank you. Uh, so that draws us to a close. Um, I'm so sorry that we've not managed to get to everyone's questions. There were questions about hot and cold flushes, about um, spelling and writing problems, about how to put in eye drops, and a whole host of other uh, comments and queries. So we will try and respond to those um, uh, via email after the event, along with a link to the recording so you can watch back anything that you'd like to. Um, but it really remains only for me to say a huge thank you to everyone um, on the screen, um, to everyone who to you for attending um, and particular thanks to um, uh, Livy Wood, Claire Waddington and Emma Jones uh, for all their work behind the scenes to help bring us together um, for these webinars and to um, Nikki for pulling the agenda together. So thank you so much. Um, there's going to what follows is a short video uh, from the National Brain Appeal, which is a relatively new one in case you think you've seen may have seen it before. Um, so just encourage you to watch that. Um, but other than that, I wish you hope you uh, can continue to stay warm and uh, that we will see you again soon after Christmas um, at a, another webinar like this or an, even better an in-person event or one of the peer groups but thanks so much for your attention today and we'll look forward to seeing you soon. Bye for now. Hello my name is Eva Tate and I'm the Major Appeals Manager for the National Brain Appeal. The National Brain Appeal is the charity that raises much needed funds for the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery and the um, UCL Queen Square Institute of Neurology, altogether known as Queen Square in London. It is our aim as a charity to improve the lives um, of people living with neurological conditions across the UK. And at the moment that is amounting to around one in six of us, including rare dementias. We have been funding rare dementia support since the beginning and certainly since it was formalised in 2016. Um, over the past few years, we've been aiming to raise up to 350,000 a year to be able to um, improve and accelerate the services available to people. And um, in line with that expansion, um, and you'll know that there's now more than 5,000 members of RDS across the UK and some worldwide. We have committed as a charity to raise up to £7 million to create the world's first rare dementia support centre. This will be a permanent home for RDS and will be created around three key pillars, which are support, education and research for professionals, healthcare professionals, and also research into um, what type of support is um, most helpful to people living with um, these conditions, their families and friends. We um, have found a site for the centre and are well on our way to um, creating this fundraising goal. Um, we've raised well over a million pounds and have had some very high profile support over the past couple of years. Most notably in the last uh, six months, um, Richard Walker, the group chairman of Iceland Foods, has climbed Everest for us, a truly remarkable feat. And 30,000 colleagues at Iceland Foods have been raising money for the Rare Dementia Support Centre over June during their fundraising weeks. So thank you very much to them. Um, but we've also had lots and lots of supporters who have done incredible um, races, runs, walks. Um, we've had people travel across the Mongolian steppe raising funds for us, um, across the Pyrenees, and also um, people doing um, bake sales and all sorts of community events as well. We'd like to thank each and every one of you, all the people who have taken part in fundraising and who continue to take part in fundraising. There is some match funding available uh, for anybody who would like to raise funds for the centre. 
and I would encourage you to get in touch with a member of our, my team, with myself or any member of the, um, the National Brain Appeal team um, who can help to support you and encourage you in any of your efforts. Um, we also had a garden at Chelsea Flower Show this year where the designer Charlie Hawkes worked with members of RDS and um, particularly those living with posterior cortical atrophy to create an incredibly beautiful garden that went on to win three medals, uh, one of which was a gold at Chelsea. So we're absolutely delighted by the awareness raising that this brought about um, and all the coverage on um, BBC. The garden has now moved to Exbury Gardens in Hampshire and it's free to visit um, by anybody who is a member of RDS and their carer. Um, we hope that it being in Hampshire will allow more people to be able to visit than um, were able to visit Chelsea. And ultimately, we hope that that garden will be able to move to the Rare Dementia Support Centre when it's ready to be able to accept it. Um, thank you again. And I encourage you, please, just to contact us if um, and to follow us also on social media that um, you'll, you'll hear a lot more news about what, what's happening at RDS. Um, in terms of fundraising and you'll also be able to keep up to date with any of our activities that we are planning over the next couple of years. Um, thank you again and we really are looking forward to making sure that this um, centre is a real home from home for those living with um, these conditions, their families and friends. Thank you again. My name is Stephanie Still and I'm the Senior Fundraising Officer at the National Brain Appeal. I'd like to start off by saying thank you to anyone who's fundraised for us in the past. You are fantastic and your efforts are really valued. I have a wonderful job at the National Brain Appeal because I get to look after all of the fundraisers who want to take on an activity to support us. Over the years, we've seen people take on incredible challenges like mar marathons, taken on triathlons, We've even had a few who braved a skydive. We've also had wonderful fundraisers who've brought together friends, family and colleagues to host a coffee morning or to arrange a golf day or carol concert, you name it, to support RDS. Our fundraisers enable RDS to keep running and mean we can continue to support people like you. So if you're interested in becoming a fundraiser or you'd like to fundraise again, I will be here every step of the way to support you. If you might be interested in taking on an active challenge like a run, swim or walk, there are a range of suggestions on our website of upcoming events that you could take part in. Or if you're like me and aren't really into sporting activities, then there's still a range of things that you can do to support us from bake sales to coffee mornings and I'll be here to make suggestions and to help you think up ideas. I really hope to hear from some of you and we'll be here to help you make a successful, fun fundraiser. Thank you.